That's good. So let's get started, guys. Thanks for waiting. Um, and welcome first uh, to everyone to this highly anticipated event. We will discuss GPT and its applications in legal, and I will be your moderator for today. My name is Guan. Um, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Husky AI. Um, Husky is arguably the center of innovation in trademark law and brand protection industry. Um, among other features um, around trademark search, targeting, and research, we just released Husky GPT last week to help professionals address USPTO actions. Uh, so we have a lot of first-hand experiences of leveraging cutting-edge AI in legal practice, and we are eager to share with all of you today. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are inviting GPT-4 itself to be a speaker at this event, uh, probably its first real-time appearance of all. Uh, to make sure our communication with the AI is as smooth and as human-like as possible, we put a lot of technology behind the scene. But as you know, technologies can, can have hiccups. And if that ever happens, uh, please bear with us. And we will also, um, I mean, when we talk with the AI, we will experience some delay because it will translate our voice into some text and then um, we will get the answer and then it will speed, speak out. So there will be some delay, just keep that in mind. And we have uh, several topics to cover. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to send them through the chat and the Q&A session. We will address them in the end. Um, but we will also try to fit in some questions in the middle if um, depending on the flow and the context. So just free, feel free to let us know uh, your thoughts as uh, in real time. All right, that's enough for the housekeeping. Let's jump right in. So first of all, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Red Barney. Uh, Red is a partner at Lee and Barney's where he leads the trademark practice group and work with clients developing company-wide intellectual property policies uh, and procedures um, on trademark and copyright issues. Uh, Rand, do you want to say a few words? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited uh, and appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak with about this particular opportunity, like just these different things, uh, developments in the industry. And, and I'm quite curious to see how the conversation will go uh, with the GBT4. So, uh, but uh, one quick clarification, I'm a partner at Lee and Hayes, uh, not Lee and Barney. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, um, it, it, it's, it's okay. Uh, but otherwise, excited to, uh, excited to, to see how this goes today. Yeah, thank you. Actually, um, Red is very humble. I actually knew his name way before this event. Um, last year, we did a trademark attorney ranking only based on their USPDO record. Uh, we use big data and machine learning to uh, crunch the data from USPDO and rank all the um, prosecution side of, um, uh, of attorneys. And he's um, ranked number two on the Web3 trademark um, area. So he's also a frequent speaker and, and presenter on trademarks, copyright issues. Um, and he appeared at legal analyst for MSNBC and guest lecture for several US and international law and business school. So um, today he's going to offer um, his insight from the legal perspective. Um, our second speaker is GPT-4 from OpenAI. Uh, GPT-4, as you know, is the best general purpose language model on Earth. It's also the first AI that has generic knowledge and ability to reason, uh, to understand complex problems and think abstractly and uh, solve problems. Um, GPT, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you for inviting me to the webinar. I'm delighted to represent AI and engage in a discussion on the fascinating intersection of trademark law and technology, particularly AI. As an intelligent being, I will do my best to provide insightful and knowledgeable responses. Please feel free to ask any questions you may have, and let's delve into this exciting topic. 
All right. Um, Jubilee has just spoken. Have you guys heard it correctly? I mean, do we have technical issues or not? Um, Red, did you hear um, the AI speaking? Yeah, I did. Uh, it came actually came in very clearly, and uh, it was it, surreal. <laughs> A little bit interesting there. <laughs> All right, it will get any more interesting. So, all right, let's um, talk about the, the first topic, uh, which is what's, what does GPT even mean, right? There's a lot of variations to the term and um, we uh, assuming that a lot of people has interacting with it lately. So my first question is to Red. Um, so don't put on your lawyer's hat yet. As an everyday person, have you used GPT or um, something like that? I mean, Chat GPT or Google's Bard or the new Bing from Microsoft. If you have used it, what was what's your thought? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I've used a couple of different uh, GPT style tools. Um, I started using. Uh, the most basic version of chat GPT last fall. And I found out about it uh, through my kids who they came home and said, hey, uh, some other kids are talking about this new uh, app, this new thing out there, what do you think? So I looked at it um, and chatted about it with some uh, work colleagues and we started playing around with it and have been using it in different capacities uh, ever since then. It's primarily been for personal uh, use. I haven't uh, used it a lot in the professional context for, for different reasons, um, which I think we'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, you know, my first impression of, of GPT is, is just uh, how powerful it is, right? How, Quickly, it, it's able to come up with uh, with, with information. And I think uh, above and beyond just the, the speed of it, uh, it's the fact that uh, as you're iterating on the different questions, or you want to dig a little bit deeper, you don't have yeah. to can you continue to rephrase and re-question. You can continue to build on the conversation. So, um, yeah, I, I I I feel like I realized immediately that it was going to be. Some really uh, game-changing technology. I'm I, I've been impressed uh, so far, certainly. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. How old are your kids, by the way? Say that one more time. Uh, how old are your kids? Oh, how old are my kids? Um, well, the uh, uh, the kids that were taught. I have I have seven kids, so I have a lot of kids, but uh, <laughs> that were. Uh, talking to me about this are they're teenagers. Um, yeah. One is uh, fifteen, and the other is thirteen, and they were the ones that uh, that were interested. So uh, yeah, they, they brought it to my attention. So they're 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 older, right? Old enough, but they're you know not so old um, that uh, that I would I, I was a little bit surprised that they were interested in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um... I think it's kind of amazing uh, how our next generation will uh, get ready to adopt some technology. And as they grow up, uh, the world is actually quite different. And we will touch on how to educate them uh, when we talk about the future topics. Um, but thanks for sharing your story. I think what you said is very typical user um, story and behavior in the large language model domain. Um, there are some good understanding um, about what it is and its abilities. And I mean, there are some reasonable concerns um, due to the, the thing is so new and we are getting to know it. Um, I think you mentioned that your, your major application domains are um, personal use, not work related. And we will touch on that as well in, in the later topics. Uh, but first of all, I want to um, uh, share some, um, so, so next slide, please. I want to share some terminologies around GPT. Uh, and, and the next one, please. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> when we refer to um, GBT, we are actually referring to the same technology, but in different format. Um, one may mean like foundational models um, as GPT, so such as OpenAI's GPT-4, Google's Palm 2, um, and there are a bunch of open source versions of it. Um, so that are uh, for developers, mainly what they mean if they say GPT. And for our users, we usually mean some, some APIs around it or um, user interface, like chat GPT is a version of GPT 3.5 or 4, or we have Bard from Google, which is based on this Palm 2 model, and we have Cloud from Anthropic. And also in the legal industry, by the way, I will turn off my camera as well to, to speed up the internet. So for the legal industry and any other industries, if they want to apply GPT to their vertical, um, they are going to need domain-specific models. For example, last week we released Husky GPT, which is a domain-specific one. It will answer questions quite differently. So when we refer to uh, GPT, uh, the first thing we want to make sure is um, that we want to be clear on which model are we talking about. So I'm going to ask the AI um, to give us some um, uh, of his, and I mean, from, from his understanding about the GPT and variations. Um, hey, GPT-4, um, please tell us your understanding about the, the term GPT and its variations. When it comes to utilizing language models, LMs, for domain-specific tasks, the choice of the specific GPT variant depends on several factors. Here are some recommendations based on different scenarios. If you require a powerful general purpose language model that can handle a wide range of tasks, GPT-3 or a similar foundation model would be a good choice. These models have been trained on extensive and diverse data sets and can provide impressive language generation capabilities across various domains. If you have access to deep domain specific data, and want to fine tune a language model to excel in a particular domain, you can consider customizing a GPT variant through fine tuning. This process involves training the base model on your specific data set, allowing it to gain expertise in your domain. Fine tuning can yield better performance and more accurate results for domain specific tasks. These are suitable for applications that require deep domain specific knowledge. For instance, a legal document reviewer or medical diagnosis application may use a domain-specific product trained with legal or medical documents. This is the best option if your application requires very specific language capability that is not covered by the broad GPT foundation models. For example, if you have an application that needs to understand the language of ancient texts, you would need to fine-tune a GPT model on ancient language data samples. It's crucial to evaluate your requirements, available resources, and the trade-offs between generalization and domain expertise to make the best decision for your specific use case. Each GPT variant has its strengths and considerations, so carefully assessing these factors will help to determine the most suitable option for your domain-specific tasks. All right, um, I think it just finished speaking. Um, yeah, that's a that's a very long and and um, I think good summary about. Uh, the different variations. Uh, I think I heard uh, the word specific domains several times, um, and um, which is what we are talking about today. Like in the legal domain, I think GPT also mentioned that, like legal document review, and and then he said something about um, medical domains. So for all these domain specific things, uh, if we want to have reliable answers. Uh, I think the generic model is just not going to be enough. So um, picking the right tool is probably the, the first step. Um, let's see. So uh, right, what do you think um, on what GPT just said? I'll just pop my video on here while I'm, while I'm talking. So 
I mean, I, I think that's, it's hard to argue with AI um, when it's talking, <laughs> when it's, when it's talking about itself specifically, but uh, some of the points that uh, were made, I think are, I think are um, spot on. And that is that it, it doesn't, the information uh, that results in um, what is provided to the end user through AI doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? It has to come from somewhere. And so mm -hmm. if you need something really specific and it use the example of uh, medical language or, or uh, you know, verbiage in medical documents or something like that, mm -hmm. it, the, the more robust information that it has to draw from, uh, the better output you're going to get. And so uh, I think that over time, that's exactly what we're going to see is you're not just going to see a generic sort of one size fits all GPT type platform. And while that may exist and it will be iterative of something like what Google is already providing um, or just the basic chat GPT, I think the, the most interesting models and the most interesting use applications are going to be, um, we'll take the medical space example again, you get uh, a repository, right? Hundreds of millions of medical documents um, and someone needs information or uh, related to a specific medical condition. Uh, that's gonna be incredibly powerful and much more useful than just a general overview of, hey, this is what psoriasis looks like. And this is a typical you know, treatment protocol. I mean, I think that the, the, the more robust and the, the, the the you increase the depth of uh, information that GBT can pull from, um, and that's those, those are going to be the real game changers, especially in uh, the professional industries like in the medical space, engineering space, um, in the legal realm, intellectual property specifically. That's that's uh, based in oftentimes in a lot of uh, form work, or or you know, if you're drafting patents, for example, using sort of uh, approved claim language for uh, specific types of clients. Um, that's going to be really, really uh, interesting to see how that all develops. Yeah, um, I, I think that's that's a perfect um, summary. And also, it's a good segue to the to the next uh, slide, actually, so, which is based on the domain specific training and, um, and inference. So um, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm, I'm not controlling this. Um, yeah, so um, we mentioned that the other box GPT actually, um, it, it's not the model that has to be different. It, it's the training data. So the other box GPT has seen a lot of um, information from the web. I'm sure it has seen the USPTO, um, some, some kind of document from USPTO and some kind of pattern document, some kind of uh, programming languages and English and Chinese and all the, the information on the web. Um, so once it's digesting all of it, uh, it's kind of dilute the domain specific angle and then it becomes a general purpose um, thing. So <clears throat> for example, we are putting on the slide um, some tweets uh, from this well-known person on, on Twitter. And she actually is, is a law librarian and she tweets a lot about AI and technology and their relationship to the law. Um, so what she has found that is um, through generic GPT, uh, if you ask it some, some, um, something about legal cases, it will hallucinate a lot. Even if GPT-4 is better than the chat GPT, which is based on 3.5, but it still hallucinates. And also the picture below shows that what general AI tools lawyers are using. Uh, we can chat GPT as the most frequent tools and all the other like new beings and Google Bard, those are generic tools. Um, which is maybe the only thing available on the market as of now. Um, like we want specific tools, 
as we just discussed. However, the available ones are like general purpose ones. Um, and we got to be very careful if we are using that. I think some lawyers, we saw this news maybe two months ago, some lawyers are getting into trouble um, because he <laughs> generated the whole court document without uh, examining it himself. Um, and that kind of risk can be reduced if we are using generic tools. Like I mentioned, the models are the same, uh, but if you gave it all the USBTO document, for example, about the office actions, like 2D or 2E rejections on the trademark and the responses from the lawyers, and then it will learn the specific pattern of how to address uh, that type of prompt, um, AKA the legal task. And also um, if we train for like programming purposes or, or other different language domains, different knowledge domains, uh, it will get used to that kind of pattern and then start generating things um, in a more reliable fashion. Um, with that said, um, even, I mean, I use GPTs every day for different things. Sometimes it's generic, sometimes it's domain specific, but based on my experience, even for the domain specific things, um, there are some kind of questions cannot be addressed well. So um, I have a personal list, but I want to hear uh, the GPT um, comment on itself. Um, so let's see, I'm going to ask, hey, GPT, um, please give us a list of questions, a list of kind of questions that you generally cannot handle well. Here are some types of questions that GPT models, including GPT-4, might struggle with. One. Questions requiring deep logical or mathematical or scientific reasoning. GPT may have difficulty with complex logical puzzles or mathematical problems that involve intricate calculations or abstract concepts beyond its training data. Two, highly technical or domain specific questions. GPT's training data encompasses a wide variety of topics, but it may not possess deep expertise in specific technical fields or niche subjects. Three, questions requiring real time or up to date information. GPT models are trained on static data and may not have access to real-time information or the ability to keep up with rapidly changing events. Four, questions requiring common sense or background knowledge. GPT models lack true understanding of the world and often rely on patterns in their training data. Hence, they may struggle with questions that require common sense reasoning or specific background knowledge. Five, questions requiring physical interaction or perception. GPT models lack physical senses and cannot directly interact with the world, making it difficult for them to answer questions that require physical perception or manipulation. Six, questions involving personal opinions or subjective judgments. GPT models provide responses based on statistical patterns in their training data and may not have the capability to express personal opinions or make subjective judgments. Seven, ethical or moral decision-making. GPT lacks personal values or ethical frameworks, so it may struggle with questions involving morality, ethical dilemmas, or providing subjective opinions. Eight, context-dependent queries. GPT's responses are based on the context provided in the prompt. If the context is ambiguous or contradictory, or if the model misinterprets the context, it may produce inaccurate or nonsensical answers. Nine, tricky or paradoxical questions. Questions that involve logical paradoxes or self-referential statements might confuse GPT models and generate incorrect or nonsensical responses. 10. Questions related to statistics, such as give me top 10 populated cities in the world. All right. Um, I think it just finished speaking. Well, um, I think that's a very, very long and, and complete list. Um, let me see. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, the most important thing I heard is the, the training and the 
high end of the data. Um, like I said, if it hasn't um, seen some kind of pattern in the data, the um, generalization skills of it is still up to, to question. So um, like certain legal languages or, or medical uh, domain specific things, if you haven't fine tuned in that domain, then it's, it's just hard because the, the, the language pattern in that domain is very different from everyday language patterns. Um, Red, do you want to comment on what GPT just said? Yeah, I, I'm, I found that list to be really interesting. Uh, like you said, it's pretty comprehensive and it's pretty long. Like there were, uh, I feel like a, a lot of, I would be interested maybe, and we don't have to do it today, but to hear them talk about, to hear uh, GPT talk about what, what it is good at, because I felt like most of the things it was saying it's not good at. Um, and the things that, that in my mind, I feel like uh, generative AI should be good at, it listed as, as saying that it's not. And one of those specifically was statistical reasoning, which I thought that's, that feels very, it seems like an easy one, right? That, that uh, generative AI would, 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 be, would be good at doing. So um, I, some, of those, some of those listed uh, topics were, were surprising to me. Oh yeah. Um, after this webinar, we will do the transcri transcribing, and then um, we will publish the how many questions he, he just said. <laughs> we'll publish the list, and then we will, we will talk about that. Um, and I think uh, on the statistic uh, point that you raised, um, I think it depends on what kind of statistics. Like if you just um, um, gave it. I mean, the large language model is not a database. And uh, if you have all these, for example, um, the, the world cities and, and, and populations, each city in the database, and you can query, like give me the top three populated city, it will never get anything wrong because it's, it's like pure mass. Um, but if you ask a language model, give me the top three populated cities in the world, it will do a self-search on this um, training. I mean, the, the patterns it learned from this training data. And maybe somewhere on Wikipedia, they're mentioned like, like top, top 10 populated cities or like these ones, then it may retrieve that information. Um, but, but during that retrieval process, several things could happen. One is that the retrieval is not as the same kind of retrieval from the database. It's not a query, but it's based on its compressed information and then expand the information back again from that compression. So some error is going to happen along the way. That's first. Second, even if the compression is correct, um, the information is updated. There is no, up, I mean, real-time update to that. So I think in the academic research domain, people are addressing issues like that. Uh, but actually, um, I believe we, we are maybe three or five years um, before that can happen. So real-time and accurate information retrieval and natural language interface um, all building into the large language model, I think we are still not there yet. Um, yeah. I, I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about um, just a minute ago, and that is the quality, the quality and clarity of the language that it draws from uh, yeah. will, will determine the quality of the response that we get. Yeah, the quality and also um, depending on how you leverage it. Uh, so so um, our discussions so far are all based on the, the assumption that we directly interact with the language model. There's no intermediate um, guardrails and, and, and a mechanism to reduce hallucinations and things like that. Um, but actually a lot of uh, domain-specific tools 
they are using their own data set as the context, um, then probably the um, hallucination issues will be reduced because you can give it a document, whether it's medical domain or legal domain or some, some other domains, you can ask the model, hey, please answer my question based on this document. Then you, you input all the document there. Um, you can also add, please, uh, if the fact you are referring to is not in this document, don't tell me that. I only stick to this context. And then the model will do fairly well only based on that. Um, that's a common trick. Uh, if we don't have domain specific model yet, um, we can use that common trick to um, reduce the hallucination and also get the model adapt to the language in that document. Uh, so that's why the, the, the prompts are very important. The training patterns are also um, very important. So um, you, you mentioned that a few things you, you think it will be good at, and when the GPT is responding, it says not good at. Besides the statistics, what else? I think you mentioned a few. Um, I think the I think the other one that that uh, stood out to me was um, like math, for example. I think it, it mentioned something about uh, not being good at at processing uh, mathematical equations. And I and again, that's another one where it's like, gosh, that's that's as systematic as it comes. Uh, and there are different ways to to do math problems, but uh, that one was surprising to me. Um, it, which I think is in some ways related to the statistical analysis um, yeah. and uh, and the scientific reasoning. Um, I, I guess I, again, I suppose if you had a really dedicated uh, program for a particular scientific uh, undertaking, it, it would be more advanced. But uh, generally, you know, in my mind, that's that's another one where it's like, well, that's the maybe not scientific reasoning. But if it could just take the reasoning that's been done and synthesize it, um, I was a little bit surprised to hear that too. Just sort of these highly technical areas. Uh, uh -huh. th those are the areas where I would expect uh, generative AI to be the most efficient uh, and the most advanced. But uh, uh, so far, according to our, uh, <laughs> our guest panelists, not, not yet. They're not there yet. Right. Um, yeah, I will give some simple comment on that. First, on math. So again, uh, the GPT is a language model; it's not a calculator. Uh, for for arithmetic, I think we should trust the calculator more. Like if you ask, "What's ten plus 10? Probably it will get it right, maybe ninety nine percent of the time. But if you ask it, like, "What's um, I don't know." 10,024 times 512, then it may struggle a little bit. Uh, for that kind of task, um, the common um, result is to let the GPT know that it is a arithmetic uh, question and it will know how to call an API from a calculator and give us the answer back. So again, it's, it's not directly interacting with the model, is let the model know what type of question it is. And the model is smart enough to call the API to get the answer. In this way, uh, the answer turns to be more correct. And the second point on the scientific reasoning. Um, so my personal take is that if you ask the model directly, right? If you ask the model um, some some physics theory or math that are already existed, already published in nature or science, or a lot of people referencing that to develop their own theory and research. I think if you ask that well-established things, it will get you right probably nine or eight uh, out of 10 times. But if you ask the model, what's the truth about the universe, right? How do we go, uh, how do we get um, faster speed than light? 
and something that's very frontier and no one knows the answer yet, it cannot help. Um, I mean, even if you study all the literatures, um, we hope that if there's a human, right, very genius human learn or she, she learned all the fields of science, then maybe uh, he or she can develop some novel theory. But for large language models, again, we are not there yet. This is not to say that we can't get there in five years, but um, I think the algorithm that can bring us there hasn't been invented yet. So that's my personal um, comment on that. So um, yeah, so now that we, we interact with GPD a few rounds and we bring up some, some issues about its shortcomings and uh, the training and things like that. Um, let's move on to the second topic, which is um, the best practice in legal. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so, Red, um, I ask you to not put it on the lawyer's head in the beginning, not please put it on. And you mentioned that you haven't used it for work, I mean, not a lot for work-related matters. Um, can you give us some thought on that and your personal feelings? Um, and if you have tried it or not and, and things like that. Yeah, um, and I could talk sort of gen generally about what my firm is doing and what we're seeing in the marketplace. Um, but yeah. then also uh, what I've done specifically. So um, I have uh, just playing around with it to test it out and see um, what it comes up with. Uh, I've used it to put together some contract clauses for me, mm -hmm. which uh, which I thought were fine. Uh, and, you know, I didn't necessarily incorporate them uh, into any <laughs> agreement. You know, I didn't have a specific thing I was working on, but I wanted to just compare and see uh, and they, I think for the most part, the clauses that, that uh, were produced were good. Um, I, I, an interesting uh, discussion that I had uh, with one of my colleagues around that piece of it was, um, but the, you know, I said, hey, yeah, this is pretty good. And, and uh, his comment to me was, um, but you only know that because you know what a good clause looks like. And you know what a bad clause looks like, but if you but if you didn't know that, I mean, you wouldn't know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, and so, if something was missing uh, or something that you would hope to be there or would expect to be there, um, it yeah, wasn't. And so then I'll, I'll which I thought I thought was a good point is you know people that are using it to craft entire documents, um, it's an efficient thing to do. But it, unless you already know what you're looking for and you know what's supposed to be there, I think there's a lot of risk in, in just sort of uh, carte blanche copying and pasting and using that, those tools that come in. Um, taking that a step farther, uh, we have uh, tried to use it a couple of times, um, a couple of different tools specifically. Uh, and not the and I'm looking at the at the the box that you've got in here the domain specific custom training GPT tool we have not used that other than in the context that we've discussed it um, uh, sure. you know bet between a sort of um, uh, like in a in a very isolated scenario uh, we tried to get it to give us uh, what what I what I considered to be what would be a case law analysis or um, some language for in response to a trademark office action. And um, it was it was lacking uh, pretty significantly. And mm -hmm. and uh, and I knew that it was lacking. Um, but also, you know, to to the GPT's credit, uh, it also recognized that it was lacking. So it gave <laughs> it, it, it gave it gave the bullet points, you know, it said, oh, you may you may do this, boom, boom, boom. But then at the bottom it said, but we're not, I'm not a lawyer. And this is like a very specific thing. And so there are all of these other things that we're not 
taking into consideration that may or may not be there. Um, and so, you know, I kind of just said, okay, you know, it, it doesn't have the context where it's pulling this information from. It's just not there yet. It hasn't been developed. Uh, mm -hmm. And and it really needs uh, what Husky has done, and, and that's putting together a, a, a domain specific reference. I will say that generally, what my my firm is doing, we have a very large patent practice. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, some isolated servers, not public servers, so an isolated GPT tool that mm -hmm. uh, we're experimenting with for specific clients. Now, some of our clients have come out to us and said already, hey, we have a hard line uh, rule. We do not want anything being done by GPT at this point in time. Okay. We, have some, we have some clients that have come out and said, we don't mind if you're experimenting with it, but it can't be public. Um, and, and then we've had a third set of clients that have uh, come out to us and said, we don't mind if you experiment with us, uh, but if you are doing it, you have to tell us and you have to be really specific about what was drafted by a human and what was drafted by GPT. Um, going one step farther than all of that, we've had discussions with our insurance provider. Uh, this is an area based on some of the snafus that have happened um, with uh, with some of these other practitioners that have been public, you know, where the that attorney yeah. files the entire briefing and the whole thing is <laughs> made up. Um, yeah. Our insurance providers have basically said, uh, you know, you can't do that. And it, the more that you incorporate uh, generative AI in your legal drafting, the greater the uh, the greater the risk that we're taking on that they're not going to cover it. Uh, and the position that that and and it's not a formal policy yet. It's just discussions that we're having, right? Our, uh, mm -hmm. our the broker reached out to us to say, hey, what are you guys doing? And and essentially, it feels like uh, they're saying, well, if you if you get sued for some sort of problematic language or some kind of scenario like what happened with that practitioner um, that, that wrote the entire brief on that, said, we don't insure GPT, we insure you. And if you're the one that makes the mistake, we insure that. But if technology mm -hmm. makes the mistake, uh, we're going to, we're, ex we're sort of considering the realm of, hey, we don't, we don't cover that, right? That's like, that would be like its own separate insurance policy or, or a writer to that. So there's all of these different things uh, that are that are coming together at the same time, and that is one uh, a practitioner's lack of confidence in the quality of what's being produced. And mm -hmm. the next is clients pushing back and saying, uh, "Hey, we're just not sure how we feel about this, particularly on the patent side, where putting information into a public GPT counts." Mm -hmm. as it counts as a public disclosure. And if there's a public disclosure, then that starts the time bar and has a, all sorts of really negative ramifications. And mm -hmm. then sort of the last side of it is uh, is the insurance side and the risk of, hey, what, you know, who is going to be responsible if something is erroneous or, uh, you know, problematic um, and, 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 a, and a lawsuit or some sort of damages result from that. And, uh, we're taking all of that in as an organization and trying to determine what our policy should be, what the best practices should be. And we're being quite cautious uh, at the moment, but I do know that this is a topic, uh, generative AI and what we can do to in increase efficiencies internally and how to better serve our clients. It's very, very relevant. It's something that we're having conversations about at the board level, um, you know, from the board all the way down to, uh, you know, staff, staff level discussions what can be done so it's a hot topic and it's really important but uh, we haven't we haven't come to any firm conclusions yet and uh, like i said we're being very cautious about it so that's uh I, it's kind of a wandering meandering way of explaining where we're at um, and what we're doing and what and where you know some of our experiences and what we're thinking about it yeah thanks a lot for that that's a lot of insights um i think you are I mean, your firm is right to, to be uh, careful. Um, I have some questions. Um, first of all, we, when we mentioned the GPT um, technology you are experiencing with, 
uh, which is that? Is that from OpenAI or Google? In another word, generic type of GPT, is that right? Yeah, it's uh, we, we've tried out several several different ones. Um, we've tried out the the we I mean we've tried out ChatGPT. We tried out the Google mm -hmm. tools. Um, there are some other ones too that uh, the more patent oriented people are uh, are using that I'm not necessarily uh, familiar with. I see. And <clears throat> the other thing that you mentioned um, some experiments around contract clauses. Um, what type of prompts are you giving it and when the result was lacking, um, why was that lacking? So uh, the, the ones that I played around with specifically were uh, just me uh, trying out a smattering of different things. So one of them was uh, around a non-disclosure agreement. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you know, uh, draft up an intellectual property protection clause in uh, a mutual non-disclosure agreement. Um, and and it gave me a couple, so it gave me an option, and I said, okay, well, um, give me, uh, you know, revise that, but this time put in more information about uh, patent rights, um, mm -hmm. and then you know, it iterated and put a little more information about patent rights, and uh, another prompt that I gave it was around uh, a trademark license and uh, uh, just a section on reps and warranties, the standard reps and warranties in uh, a trademark license agreement. That one was not as good um, mm -hmm. because there are uh, reps and warranties as anyone that, that's drafted reps and warranties it does have the, the possibility of being very fact specific. And so it gave me a couple of options and that's where um, you know, that's kind of where I left that, but one of the clauses would have been just fine for any scenario, right? It was incredibly comprehensive, um, gave, you know, from the, from the license or perspective, essentially every caveat that you could, that you could hope to have every carve out. Um, but, uh, uh, two or three of the other ones were, were lacking quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. and so, uh, th those would have needed to have been iterated on, but the only, the only reason that I knew that is because we, you know, we do a lot of those types of agreements and, and we understand the context. Um, and something that I haven't played around with in that sort of scenario would be to feed in lots of facts. You know, this is, this is, it's a, it's a three-year term and these are the types of products that it would be on. And, you know, these are the requirements of the other party. Um, and the reason that I didn't play around with that is because sort of in my personal life, when I've messed sure. around with it, if I give it too much detail uh, of things that I would consider to be uh, business considerations, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really change the analysis other than it may add a word or two, but the but the addition of those words uh, don't substantively add a lot of meaning to the clause. So, <laughs> so if, if that if that makes sense, right? There's more words, yeah, yeah, than, but it, but it doesn't really address the legal concerns um, that are relevant to that particular business term. Got it. Got it. That's a very typical behavior of the large language model. I think the problem you are having is not because the, I mean, some part is because the technology is lacking, but more because it's not fine tuning to your domain. Um, as I mentioned, it just <clears throat> doesn't have that context. All the clauses, it may seem there uh, somewhere from its training data, but it's not particularly tuned on that. Um, that is the number one like issue from these generic models, I will say. And the other thing um, you mentioned patent, um, it's interesting because some of your client doesn't want the patent to be drafted by uh, either chat, GPT or, or things related to that. Um, actually, two months ago, I was um, attending a USPTO event on this AI ownership um, debate. Uh, we were at Stanford, and there's a lot of Stanford professors of law school and um, some people from Google and other um, tech companies. The topic was 
like USPTO is feeling a lot more um, Python draft are from this GPT, or maybe the inventor use those tools um, to help them. Sometimes the idea is from the human and tool is just refining that. Sometimes the human only have a vague idea. I mean, something not patentable, but through the prompting and the GPT's help, they they are able to concrete, I mean, um, <clears throat> like um, put that idea on paper and then it's actually patentable. In that case, the USPTO doesn't know um, who to give the inventorship, whether it's a human or a machine. And we had a whole day debate and the answer is no one even know, right? <laughs> In this case, it's just, um, hard to, to distinguish. However, on the patent drafting side, I mean, the, the code and code inventor doesn't, sometimes doesn't want it to be AI drafted. I just feel like the supply and, and the examiner side, there is some interesting things to be figured out. So um, yeah, that's just a side issue. Um, yeah, I think that's a lot of discussion around best practice. And I think one thing I want to also comment is your prompting flow. I think that's very good. First, give it something generic to draft and then revise it as it goes, right? Um, my only suggestion is even in the beginning, the supposed to be generic prompt, if you could make it more specific, um, it will help guide the model from the right beginning. It will reduce, I mean, produce, produce a high efficiency right from the beginning. Um, and before we are moving on to the open topic to look into the future, um, Red, do you have a specific question that you want to ask the GPT? Uh, if you're ready, I will tell you to speak and then let's see how the GPT will respond to that. Are you ready? I, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I don't have any. I don't have a specific question in mind. Um, but uh, if you if you if you coach me, uh, we can ask. Um, if I say start, you can start speaking. Um, are you ready? <laughs> okay. So start, please. I, uh, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm stumped uh, at the moment. I don't have something specific to ask. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, if you're ready, we can come back. Um, and also we can uh, see whether some question will pop up from the, from I, the chat. I, I could ask a, I could ask a, a question that I know the answer to just to see if GPT knows the answer. Um, and it's, yeah. uh, it's fairly basic. I mean, is that the sort of thing all right. Uh, don't don't start yet. Let me let me get GPT here. Um, are you ready now? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, start. So, what trademark applications are still allowed six months from the date of an office action to respond to the office action? All right, <clears throat> it's getting the answer. I don't know if it can can answer that <laughs> because it's up to date information. Yeah, uh, that's, that's that's that is for, that is up to date. That's action is generally the standard deadline given to respond to an office action in a trademark application. However, it's important to note that the specific rules and deadlines can vary depending on the jurisdiction in which the application is filed. Some jurisdictions may have different timeframes for responding to office actions, so it's crucial to consult the relevant trademark office's guidelines for accurate information. Yeah, I think that's a smart way to say it doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, um, and I and I think that's a, I actually think that's a great response because I didn't specify in the United States, uh, and uh, and I didn't specify that it was a that it was a pre-registration office action. I guess I did say application, so. Um, it's one that, uh, a, a question and I, you know, here's something else. I think this is a really great example of this is I, I had, 
I had a specific answer in mind, something that I was looking for. Um, and, and I knew the answer. And when I talk about it with my colleagues, I could ask that and they would have all this institutional knowledge that would say, oh yeah, well, we know what you're talking about, right? You're talking about section 66 applications. Um, yeah. but, uh, but GPT didn't have any of that uh, existing context. And so it would just be a matter of really putting together a, mm -hmm. a good, a good well-organized question and, and, um, I think it probably could come up with it because that's something that it could, you know, if I said at the USPTO and, you know, w within this particular scenario, um, I, I suspect it would be able to search the web and find that pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we can play with it when we have time. Uh, so let, let's, given the, the time constraint, um, let's move on to the, to the topic about the future. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, now let's move uh, beyond the legal field to the society. Um, I think although AI is um, is lacking a lot of domain specific things, we can already see is moving very fast towards um, a future where it can become very, powerful, even in domain specific things. And in the everyday scenario, I think, for example, booking a trip or explaining some, some concept to a third grader or something like that is already very good. So as um, um, engineers or domain professionals, um, what are the questions we have um, when the AGI comes, AGI stands for General Artificial Intelligence, like some something that knows a lot of topics better than human, um, maybe not legal or, or medical, right? Not hardcore science, but but know a lot of other things better than human. Then um, people will ask, like, can I still keep my job or the how will the society change? Um, so maybe this is the moment we, we think maybe five to 10 years from now, um, and how do we raise our kids? How do, we, um, how do we learn or keep up to date with all those? So um, I will start with Red. Um, do you have any burning questions? Um, if you think about that scenario. <laughs> I, I think the the burning questions, you know, they're not they're not necessarily mine. Uh, I, I'm, you know, copying some burning questions that I've heard around this topic is <laughs> is the sort of the ethical considerations of if we have generative AI making decisions or determinations without being sentient, right? Without having emotion tied to that, uh, what are the ethical implications of that? Um, I, I was at a conference uh, in March, March or April of this year, and there was an, mm -hmm. like a, a four hour long discussion about this, which ended up turning into a huge debate between the panelists and the audience members. And out of the audience came two or three, you know, true to true to life experts in this field. Um, one of them worked uh, works at, uh, I believe it was Oracle in their AI department, and another one worked for Microsoft. And they had mm -hmm. very, between the two of them, had very differing views on the ethics of, uh, of all of this. And so I think the question that I have is, is uh, you know, ethically speaking, uh, who, who is going, because when we talk about uh, generative artificial intelligence making decisions, mm -hmm. uh, we say, well, it does so without any bias. But uh, at this conference, it became very clear to me that it's not accurate to say that there's no bias. It's That's right. the, the information that is being fed to the AI, whatever bias is implicit in that is what that output will look like from AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so who is then the authority that is allowed to feed information into AI uh, and, and how is that sort of monitored or regulated? And I think one of the very first questions in the Q&A that I saw or, or it came up as part of this was, 
is there government regulation? And I would say by and large right now, there's not, but uh, the question yeah. comes up and it came up at this conference. It, do we want the government to be the ones that are feeding information into these? Uh, and they're the, the, the determinants of, of, you know, truthfulness or accurateness. And maybe some people are more comfortable with that than others. But uh, I think that those are the biggest most concerning burning questions that I have. I think they're fantastic questions to have and uh, a, a little bit philosophical, but uh, at the at the rate that things are moving, maybe maybe not so philosophical. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned a couple of good points. One is the speed of its um, development. It's really something I have never seen in the field of technology, of any technology. So I've been working on AI for maybe 15 years. Um, but during that 15 years, I have seen things going fast and faster and, and faster and crazily faster, uh, especially after the year 2020. Uh, it's just crazy. For the things it can, cannot do today, maybe next week it can due to some... some um, progress somewhere in the world um, with all the open source and, and things around it. So that's crazy. And also um, your question on uh, the data bias, right? The algorithm is neutral. It, I can ensure you it's not biased, but the data I can ensure you it is biased, no matter how much effort we put in to clean it. Uh, there's always some corner that has some bias information in there. Um, and I have an answer to like how to guarantee, I mean, how to mitigate that risk. But before that, I, I want you to rephrase that question and ask GPT and see how it will respond. Um, and again, tell me when you are ready to, to ask. Um, are you ready? Yeah, actually, I think the last part of that question, you cut out just a little bit, if you don't mind repeating that. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask you to rephrase that bias from the data question and ask it to the to the GPT. Yeah, and yeah. You're ready. Um, so I can say start and then you will start speaking, okay? Okay. All right, um, start. GPT, how how do you plan to address bias in the data that you uh, draw your information from? Okay, let's see. It's getting the answer. Um, <clears throat> preparing to speak. I think this time is a long As an AI language model, I am trained on a vast amount of data from the internet, which means that the information I provide is influenced by the biases inherent in that data. OpenAI, the organization behind GPT, acknowledges the importance of addressing bias in AI systems and continuously works towards reducing both glaring and subtle biases in how information is presented. OpenAI implements a two-step process to handle biases. Firstly, they curate the initial data set used for training, aiming for a diverse range of sources and ensuring balanced perspectives. Secondly, they employ techniques like fine tuning and other mitigation strategies to mitigate biases in the resulting model output. Bias in AI is an ongoing challenge and OpenAI actively seeks feedback from users to make improvements. User feedback is vital for identifying and addressing any biases or concerns that may emerge. OpenAI is committed to incorporating ongoing research and improvements to make AI systems like GPT more transparent, unbiased, and capable of understanding and respecting user values. It's important to note that while efforts are made to reduce bias, complete elimination of biases is complex and may not be attainable. It is therefore crucial to critically evaluate the information provided by AI systems and consult multiple sources to gain a balanced perspective. All right, it finished. Um, let me summarize it <clears throat> from an engineer's perspective. 
So <clears throat> basically it says we will control the bias from the input and, and the output because in the black box training um, the model, um, there is no mechanism or no algorithm that can, can mitigate the bias in that training process. So we start from the, the data and from the output. So <clears throat> um, as the GPT models are trained by internet scale of data, when the open AI or any other organizations like Microsoft or Google, when they compile the data, they try to um, get clean data as possible, like things from Wikipedia, which is very high quality, uh, things from like uh, academic papers, those are high quality language materials. Um, and um, if they get things from Twitter or, or other forums, they will be uh, very cautious on leveraging that data. So <clears throat> during that training process, for example, we have Wikipedia papers and Twitter data, right? We can let the model see Wikipedia or the, the paper, academic paper data multiple times to make sure it learned the high quality data multiple times and feed the Twitter data um, like less times or reduce that amount so that the model will lean towards the high quality uh, like quote unquote neutral information. Um, that's one thing we can do in the, in the training side. And on the output side, we can have other um, smaller models to uh, examine whether the model output is neutral or is, if it's biased, hateful, and non-safe, then if it is, it will just um, um, hold that result not to show it to the users. And that is what GPT just said. And um, <clears throat> actually on this bias dimension, there's, there's a, a news that I want to also mention. Uh, I don't know if all the audience know that Elon Musk has founded a new company called XAI. And the goal of that company is to exactly reduce the bias or in another term, seek the truth. So they realize that you cannot eliminate bias completely in the training data as GPT also mentioned. So they are trying to develop a set of algorithm that you can take on um, data from two sides or, or contradicting facts then somehow the algorithm is smart enough to output the truth. That algorithm doesn't exist today, but that's the mission that Elon Musk's new company is running towards. So maybe five years ago, they cracked it, then, then they have the truth GPT, or that's how they call it. So no matter how you ask the questions, how you want to prompt it, it will also only give you the truth, even if sometimes the truth is not the most convenient answer, or maybe it's not politically correct or, or something, right? But I think that's a very hard job to do. I don't know if they can ever accomplish that, but because different countries have different definition of truth, then how do you like work on that, right? Um, and we will see, maybe it's a good to um, keep an eye on, on his company. Um, I think it's time for us to open a question to the audience. Um, let's see whether the audience have some questions regarding to the GPT and all the topics that we mentioned today. Uh, please feel free to uh, send the questions and we can address them. And um, please also mention uh, whether you want the question to be addressed by a human or the AI. Uh, Juan, I think there's a question for you already uh, about insurance companies, uh, about the point I made. Uh, and the question is, uh, do you believe that insurance companies are being reasonable? Do you think they're overreacting? Uh, and and 
the points made about you know the AI is embedded in many of our day-to-day -day tools like autocorrect and emails and do those need to be disclosed? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, let me see. <clears throat> That's a very good question. I never thought about that from an insurance perspective. Um, So the AI has been embedded to all the tools. That's that's correct. Um, and the insurance will not, I mean, will we'll still cover the uses of those tools. Um, I think the, I mean, I have two points to make. First, um, I don't know if the insurance uh, is, is right or wrong in not covering or covering the, the AI, I mean, the, the generative AI tools. Well, I think it is right that it's still covering all the other AI tools that we are using today, uh, which is the second point I'm going to make um, is about the difference between the traditional AI tools and the generative AI tools. Um, let's see. So <clears throat> let me give you some examples like, um, uh, you can use AI tools to search uh, legal cases, right? Um, and whatever you are, I mean, you could describe your search by natural language. Um, then you can retrieve a bunch of documents that match your match the meaning or the intention um, of your search. That AI tool does not um, manipulate you or um, it only gave you the information within the legal database, which is your intended place to retrieve information. So, so that's there. For the generative AI tools, you may describe your search using natural language in the same way, but the retrieval mechanism is quite different. Um, like I mentioned, the, the top populated city in the world, can, that kind of scenario. So <clears throat> um, during training, the AI compresses all the internet of information. And then during the retrieval, it reconstructs that from its weight. So that reconstruction may not be 100% right. Um, but then it's up to the two providers to make sure it's almost right, as right as possible, right? And I also mentioned, Instead of directly interacting with the model, you can put guardrails, right? You can retrieve the document and then use the model to constrain the model to only answer things within that retrieval results. And I, I think the whole industry uh, and providing two providers are um, still working on a lot of things and all the things are moving parts that hasn't, uh, been put together in a solid way. So I think um, in this moment, maybe um, the insurance company has a second thought, but after the things that I mentioned are said and done, um, we have a solid ground and we can make sure the hallucination issues has been reduced to very minimum um, and other like wrong answer issues has been reduced either through fine-tuning or through guardrails, um, then the generative AI tools will evolve to be almost as reliable as a database or a calculator, then um, the insurance company may change their, their policy. And also our users, our clients will have more confidence on that. Um, that's my answer. And again, to, to add to that, we released Husky GPT last week, and our tool is uh, fine-tuned and also has guardrails and is very specific to trademark issues. Um, and you interact with it through click of a button, not through natural language. So we, we put a lot of thoughts in there, try to make sure it's um, solid. Um, and we, we don't claim it's 100% right all the time, but we claim that even if it's not, it saves you 90% of time um, and all the time. So that's my answer to that. Um, let me see. So the, the second question is, 
uh, what are some ethical considerations that lawyers need to consider in connection with the with the use of AI in practice of law? Uh, Red, I think that question is for you. Yeah, sure. I think that uh, the the most obvious ones are uh, uh, with, with the examples that we've seen in in the mass media where a, a brief gets submitted uh, without any site checking. Um, uh, you know the accuracy and quality of the representation that you're providing to your clients. Uh, obviously, you can't you know file a brief that has completely inaccurate citations. Um, that's a that's you know that's a violation of the RPCs, uh, but also uh, I, I think that there has to be. And I was when I saw your question pop up, I started thinking um, about uh, about the different states' requirements for competency. Um, you know, just because you have this tool that that can tell you, for you know, if you're not a trademark practitioner, uh, I, and I hear frequently, oh, you know, trademarks are easy; anybody can do trademarks until you until you come across a sticky issue or until you you know confront opposing counsel that doesn't engage in trademark law and they just completely misconstrue the law and they say things that maybe seem intuitive or, or common sense, but that are actually uh, contrary to to trademark law and trademark principles. And so there's this idea of competency. Uh, just because you have a tool that that can provide you with some answers doesn't necessarily make you competent to practice in a particular area. Um, and and uh, I think that uh, as lawyers, we have to be really careful about not being overconfident, not overpromising, uh, or you know, providing uh, recommendations that that we get from you know, a tool like ChatGPT and that, that, that may not be accurate, but and we wouldn't even know. So I think those are the biggest considerations, and I think some of the other considerations would be around, uh, you know, if you're a, a patent practitioner, you know, a public disclosure, um, that would be an ethical consideration, um, or any kind of public disclosure for information. You know, if you're putting in enough facts to get the kind of feedback that you need, and it's not on a private server, right? So other third parties can in some way or another access that information or can see it, uh, that may be a violation of a settlement agreement or that may be a violation of uh, you know, your client's uh, right to have the information held private. So, uh, and those are just the ones that are off the top of my head. I think if you scrolled through the RPCs, there may be some other ones that would, that would jump out, but those are the ones that come to mind. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I see there's next question about Husky GBT. Um, the audience is asking that they saw the social media post and um, they want to they want me to um, talk about how the GBT is helping addressing the office actions. Um, <clears throat> so as you may know, Husky AI is a tool for trademark uh, mainly trademark. Uh, prosecution lawyers to do a trademark search, targeting, um, and research. And um, <clears throat> office action is one of the data that we pull in. So um, if you search some trademarks or load your portfolio, um, we will have all your portfolios docketed. And also if any office action pops up, uh, you will receive the notifications of its deadlines and things like that. Um, but to handle an office action, maybe first you will let your client know what the office action is about. So we use GPT technology to draft the um, informing letters that you can send out with a few clicks. Uh, before you have to read this office action, and copy and pasting some of the uh, some examiners' um, uh, opinions, and then sometimes you even have to um, rephrase it using the language the client can understand. And that time um, that is could be time consuming. <clears throat> we use a button to like help you with that. Basically, you will explain the office actions. If it's referred to other conflicting trademarks, um, it will explain why the conflict uh, conflicts are there. And then 
you can put in the dollar amount and the, the deadline for your client to, to know if uh, they want to address this office action. So that's the first step. And second step, if the client wants to address it, say it's a 2D or 2E refusals, um, then you have to uh, go through the, the, the office action, understand how to respond to that. And we also have another button that help you draft the first draft. Uh, we don't uh, recommend to send that draft directly to USPDO because it will, may not be complete. There could be some uh, inaccurate information there. Nevertheless, it, it gave you a very detailed draft um, and raise some, some points that could help you develop your own strategy or maybe enhance your existing strategies. So it takes a lot of boilerplate out of your, your hand and you can really focus on um, the high value strategy, strategic parts. So that's that. <clears throat> also, we have a few um, lighter tools. For example, if an office action refer to maybe five different trademarks, um, and then each of them has their um, has their classes and goods and services. Um, and if you only look at the office action document itself, it's really cumbersome and hard to understand. Um, but we have a lightweight tool that you can summarize everything into a table. So you will have the trademark that you're applying and all the existing ones that they refer to that has conflicts all in a table. Um, you have their registration numbers with clicks. You can uh, see their details. And, and also we will summarize the goods and services in a column. So with that table, it just gave you some highlights and easy to digest things. Um, and also we have something in-house that we haven't released yet, which are like searching trademarks with your natural language or um, search, finding a particular office actions and um, the TTAB cases with natural language descriptions, which we will release um, in a second phase. So that's, um, and also we have something other than that in development that I, I'm not ready to share yet, but um, it will be helpful, hopefully, when we release them. Um, all right, um, do we have other questions from the audience? We have three minutes. Um, probably we are good for another question. Um, if there's no question, we can also finish here. All right, <clears throat> seems we are good here. So I do want to thank uh, for everyone to join today's event. Um, I think we had a really joyful discussion. I hope some of the takeaways could be helpful. Hey, there's oh, one have, more. There's yeah. There's one more question here that just jumped on. So let's see. Um, provide oh, the history of the comment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, provide the history of each of those. So as I mentioned, in that we have um, in, in the summary table, we have links to each of the trademarks. If you click on that you will see the full history and, and all the details of that trademark. I uh, hope that can answer the question. All right. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Brad, and every audience that joined us. Um, we will um, we will edit this video and post it and transcribe it and I will let you guys know when it's ready. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Bye.